On April 21st of 2016, Steve Walkout stepped out of his shop near the intersection of Boulder and Sahara Highways in Las Vegas and tried to take pictures of what he thought were chemtrails. Instead, he captured something entirely different, something that wasn't supposed to be in the picture. Hi, and greetings from Stan Jan Paranormal. Stan here. I know that you've been watching this, and there's people out there that are saying to themselves, yeah, I can reproduce that on my Photoshop also. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to show the cell phone capture, and I'm going to expand it, showing that it didn't come from Photoshop, that it actually is a capture. Image in Photoshop that I just showed. Here's that same image on the cell phone that was sent to me, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand the cell phone with my fingers, to show that this image is not photoshopped, that it's actually on the JPEG that was sent to me. Here's the image right here, and we're going to start expanding it here as much as I can on this cell phone. Move it over a little bit at a time. We can see the image is starting to form right down there. That's the capture. And that's as wide as my cell phone goes right there. Uh, Steve's cell phone went a little bit wider than mine, so I could see a better image on it. And that's why I used the Photoshop images in order to expand it further so we could see what it was. But you can see this, uh, this image right here is on the original JPEG as it was captured. Now this JPEG was not my capture. This JPEG was sent to me from the cell phone of another investigator at the MUFON meeting. I've been a member of MUFON for a couple of years, but I'm not real big on posting evidence of unidentified flying objects because it's so easy to fake. Computer graphics and all of that, everything that you see online, at least 90% of them are faked. And the only thing I have to say to the people that have to fake evidence is the reason you have to fake it is because you're no good. You're not able to capture the real stuff on your own. I'm going to go through the entire process to show you what I did to try to disprove it. And those of you that are so inclined can leave comments and tell me what you think I might have missed. My own equipment goes through rigorous inspections every time we use it. But in this case, this was not a piece of my own equipment. It was another cell phone from another investigator that captured this. So I had to go back and ask Steve if he would send me a couple of photos so I could try to go ahead and show that the piece of equipment that he was using, that cell phone, is giving a true representation of what it's supposed to be capturing. When you're working with and testing a visual recording device, the two components which can usually provide false data are the CMOS or CMOS chip, which is located directly behind the lens and transfers captured light frequencies into electrical input, and the LED screen itself, which then receives that input and transfers it back into colored pixels after processing through the device motherboard. If either of these components has a malfunction, then information will be recorded that is not true to the capture, but is an inherent problem within the camera itself. The most common of these problems is that of hot pixels. Pixels on the LED screen itself that have given out and can no longer accept electrical impulses. There will be exactly one pixel in size, and the ones that I've seen are usually bright blue or bright red, and are stuck. I have seen cases where beginning investigators provided enlargements of hot pixels and tried to pass them off as paranormal activity when actually the only thing they're showing is the fallacies of their own equipment. At my request, Steve supplied me with two JPEGs from the exact same cell phone capture device. The first JPEG I requested was that he take a picture of the texturing of a wall inside of his home without a doorknob or anything else in the photo. I then put that JPEG through Photoshop as the original JPEG had been put through Photoshop. As we go about enlarging it, right about here is where we would have seen that object at and as we enlarge the photo we don't see that image anywhere in the photo. Scanning up and down it's just not in there. So this first image passes the equipment truthfulness test. The image is not in there showing it's not a hot pixel. The second was a JPEG that I requested that he take a picture of a bright blue sky which would mimic that of the conditions under which the original capture was made. Again, as in the original photo, the image would be about right here where I'm circling the enlargement cursor. As we enlarge the photo, we see nothing but blue sky. So analysis of both of these JPEGs in unison demonstrate that there is not a problem with the CMOS chip or the LED screen of this particular capture device.
The second test is to look at the original photo supplied and determine from looking at it is if it is what I term to be sincere, that is, did it actually capture what it intended to capture, or did it pick up something else that it didn't intend to capture, which could be a variety of things, sometimes lens flare, sometimes it can be a reflection off of a passing uh, windshield from an automobile. Uh, I've seen several things in photos. A big thing is people who take pictures through any kind of glass such that there might be a reflection behind. In this photo it's quite clear that none of these is the case because the camera was tilted straight up towards the air where he was trying to capture pictures of what he thought were chemtrails. There's nothing that reflects there. There's nothing that could have contaminated the photo. It's not a speck of dust on the lens as in these photos because that would be the closest thing to the CMOS sensor. When the image was expanded or enlarged, being the closest thing to the CMOS sensor, the dust would pixelate into oblivion. From these two type of checks, I therefore consider the camera equipment to be true that it's operating within the parameters it was designed, and I consider the find to be what I term to be sincere, that it was an actual capture. Now let's take a look and analyze the original JPEG itself through the Photoshop software. And I'm running CS4 here. I know that there's 5 and 6, which are later additions. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to get one yet, but I think they all do the same. In tilting his cell phone up and taking the image, Steve was trying to capture what he thought were chemtrails. What these are called in actuality are persistent contrails. Persistent contrails are those contrails up in the sky which just don't seem to dissipate but rather kind of float away with the wind or maybe get disrupted by another craft flying through them, something of that nature. In reference to these contrails, our mystery object lies right around here. It cannot be seen with the naked eye. Contrails normally don't form below the 25,000 foot level as they are composed of exhaust and ice crystals. Persistent contrails will not form when the temperature is above minus 40 degrees Celsius. For those of you stuck in the Fahrenheit world, that's minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit because that's where the scales come together at. That's usually in the 30,000 to 35,000 foot range, which is typical for an airliner to be flying, and that's probably what made these contrails in the first place. Now once we zoom in on the contrails and then we look at our unknown object, which is captured right over here to the left, we can tell that the object appears to be pretty much on equal footing with the contrails as far as the height is concerned. The weather almanac shows that the temperatures in Las Vegas on April 21st of 2016 when this JPEG were captured was a low of 61 and a high of 90. Since this is 8 o'clock in the morning that temperatures would have probably been oh 75 degrees somewhere in there. At those temperatures persistent contrails would not form at a lower altitude. So now let's go back and enlarge our object again. And once enlarged to as large as we can go without pixelating the image, let's check by comparison and see exactly what this might be. And we can tell from looking at it that it doesn't appear to be a fixed wing aircraft, military or commercial, for one thing. It's not leaving a contrail and it's right up there where the contrails are at. Not an F-117 stealth or a B-2 bomber. Doesn't even look like that mythical aurora that the government says doesn't exist. That's rumored to leave donut-shaped contrails, which the government says also don't exist. And there's no donut-shaped contrails in this JPEG capture. Definitely not a drone. As some might surmise, it's not a rotor wing craft or helicopter, although Nellis Air Force Base is close by the capture scene. Aside from the military, there are also hordes of those Las Vegas tour helicopters that fly to the Grand Canyon and up and down the Strip. There is also the Las Vegas police, which are pretty much in the air constantly. Well, almost constantly. The issue with it possibly being a helicopter is that, well, helicopters just don't fly that high. They can achieve a height of 25,000 feet if they're turbine driven, but that doesn't exclude the FAA guideline which stipulate that any craft that flies above 12,500 feet up to including 14,000 feet has to have oxygen canisters for the pilots and if it's over 15,000 feet oxygen canisters for every person on board for the duration of the flight. This craft, whatever it is, appears to be at a much higher altitude and because of the absence of contrails or motion blur appears to be hovering rather than flying. It would have to be pressurized or have oxygen for all of the occupants on board, assuming that there are occupants on board and that they actually do breathe oxygen. And it would have to be sealed against the cold, assuming that there's anyone on board and that if there is, they actually do feel the cold. It doesn't look anything at all like a weather balloon, although I'm certain if the government reviews this posting, it soon will be. 
dirigibles and blimps fly at altitudes of around 1,500 feet. And the elevation isn't high enough for it to be something in orbit like a satellite. So here we are back at the original photo. I'm going to click the enlargement cursor and we're going to enlarge this photo so that we can see the object and we're going to try to bring the object back into the viewing area because as we enlarge it it will move around the screen and we can see that that's about as large as we can get and actually tell that it's that it's something that's hanging up there and shouldn't be there if we enlarge it any more we'll get to the point where it pixelates where you see these squares in here and you'll no longer be able to see it at all uh, some people try to correct this by going to the filter option. They'll go to noise and then they'll go to be speckle and the cursor will run for a little bit. Uh, change it a little bit. You can see it smooth out and others will recommend that you hit the control F1 key and that it will do it uh, over and over again and it will smooth out better than that. Uh, excuse me, it's the control F key. Uh, and the thing is is that the only thing you're doing is smoothing the pixels out you're not actually generating a better image what we want to do is we want to generate a better image personally I want to see what this object looks like I want to get as close to it as possible and try to determine exactly what this is that's hanging up there in the sky now we've taken it back down a couple of notches and what we want to try is some form of interpolation there are three types of interpolation the first one, and the oldest one, is the nearest neighbor interpolation. And I know there's some guy sitting in the back row going, interpolate my nearest neighbor? Not like I haven't thought of that a time or two. Well, whatever it is you're thinking about, that's not what it means. What it means is that we're going to try to take the space between the pixels, where pixels don't exist, and we're going to try to populate them with other pixels so that it renders the graphics a little bit better image than what we're seeing right here. So there are three methods of interpolation that have become popular over time. The first method of interpolation was that of the nearest neighbor interpolation. And then there's bilinear and there's bicubic. The nearest neighbor interpolation basically looks at the space that's missing where a pixel should be populated and isn't. And it takes the nearest pixel and it just plugs it into that space. It just replicates it. As could be guessed, there's a certain amount of degree and error in this where straight lines sometimes are jagged looking called jaggies. The next method, bilinear, takes a sample of the four pixels that are nearest the space and it measures gradients and hues and color saturation and uses an algorithm to try to plug it into that space. And then the best method, the one that is used that is most popular, is the bicubic where it takes a sample of the 16 pixels that are around that missing space and uses the algorithm to do the same thing, to plug in the missing space. That, of course, would be uh, the, the most degree of accuracy. Um, Photoshop has all three of these and if you look at them you're going to go up here to uh, image and you're going to click your image size and you're going to find that they are right down here in a drop down menu. You have nearest neighbor, bilinear, bicubic and it doesn't use the term interpolation because I'm guessing maybe they think that just like the guy in the back row most people wouldn't know what it was. It says uh, gradient smoothing, uh, enlargement, reduction and those are the ones that are popular in Photoshop and we're gonna try using a couple of those and seeing if it changes the image a little bit but my guess is that it probably isn't going to we're gonna to have to go to a third-party option in order to try to look at this image better than what it is to refine it uh, the resolution better than what it is so here we are back here at our slightly pixelated image and we're going to try interpolation. We're going to see if that does anything to it. We're going to use the drop down menu here that I just showed you. Go to image size. And what we want to do is we want to resample the image, but we're going to have to change something in order to do it. Um, and I'm saying that we're going to boost the resolution here to try to give it a little bit finer resolution than what it was there at the 72. Let's go to uh, about 300. Now keep in mind that as you change this, you're also changing the pixel dimensions. And that if you go too high on the pixel dimensions, you're going to get a warning that you're going to use more space than your computer has. Basically, you'll freeze your computer up. So we want to go on this one here. We want to go, um, and I'm going to do exactly what it was, the byte cubic uh, uh, for smooth gradients. And we're going to click OK. 
and we're going to see that once it goes through we have the little hourglass here that shows that it's doing something it's going to revert back to the very miniature screen and we're going to have to pull it back up we'll see if that pixelation is still there there we go now we're going to have to hit the demagnify button and go just the opposite of what we were doing because now we're way 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 too intense because we increase the resolution of the entire screen and we're going to have to find our bad boy again wherever it's at down in here somewhere there it is and we're going to have to click the magnification and bring it back up and see exactly what this did to it well we can see that it made it smoother a little bit smoother As we get to a larger size, we can see more of what some kind of a craft might look like. Appears to be some black areas here with maybe a bar in between of some kind. The hueing and gradient coloration on one side is different than the other side. Uh, probably back out just a little bit here. And that probably is the best that we're going to get using the methods of interpolation that are available in Photoshop. Now the last thing to try on this before we go to a third person vendor is to unsharpen the image which is one of the very popular things that people do all the time. You basically hit filter, you're going to go to sharpen and I don't know why they call it unsharpen, you're basically sharpening the image. You'll pull up a little dialog box and as you move the cursor along if you go way out of line you'll be able to see that it changes the image entirely. It basically highlights everything in there uh, and you can see now that it's blended the black together and it's got some kind of an outline around it and if we go way up it'll get to the point where it's basically almost unrecognizable so we want to bring it back down here that actually probably is a little bit better than what it was at least uh, we're seeing a little bit more clarity in it if we back out of it if we accept it at that go say hit OK and then it's going to uh, it's going to have to filter it it's going to scroll across there again and it'll take, uh, it'll take a minute or so for it to go ahead, uh, maybe not that long, it looks like it's moving pretty fast, to scroll across there and maybe once we uh, have applied the unsharpened mass to it, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, try to zoom in on it one more time a little bit closer and we can get an idea maybe more of what this image might look like uh, according to the computer algorithm which is blending the pixelation together and deciding what it is that we need to see. Uh, you keep in mind that these algorithms are kind of like when they colorize the black and white uh, pictures and then you look at them and you're like, wow, did Clark Gable really wear a shirt that was that green? Well, you really don't know because the algorithm is only as good as the guy that wrote it. But basically in those old movies, once they get the, the flesh tones correct, usually the rest of it falls in. So even though it might be off, it's fairly close. So we can watch it and uh, be entertained by it. Uh, we're almost done with the unsharp mask here. Here it kicked right in. Let's go ahead and we'll enlarge this one more time. And we can see that now it basically, it almost has a craft image around it with uh, some kind of a blackened area in here. And I can see some red, some kind of red pixelation or something there along the top here. Um, maybe I'm not certain exactly what that is. Yeah. You know, I wish that we could go clearer than that. We're going to have to go to a third-party vendor now. We'll give a shot at what... Uh... So now we're going to a third-party vendor named On One Resize. On One puts out a program called Genuine Fractals, in which it is basically a disambiguation program, which is what we're trying to do is we're trying to take an ambiguous photo and, and remove the ambiguity about it so that we can see what it is. Um, this is uh, freeware for 60 days, and then if you want to purchase it, it's like 80 bucks. Um, it's user-friendly. The interface is very good. Um, I would have to say that uh, that if you got 80 bucks to throw around, it's probably well worth it. You come down here to the document size, and it will show you the document as it exists. And I've already resized this to the area that I wanted to see because I don't want to take too long doing it. And when I go ahead and move from the screen fit, which is the original image, and we go up to 100%. Uh, we got the little square here where we can see we're going to have to find the image by moving it down across uh, the screen area. We're going to have to locate our uh, our craft or whatever it is there and see if we can. There it is right there. 
and we can see that it's actually uh, a better image than what we got with Photoshop. Uh, still not exactly what I was hoping to find as far as some kind of a craft image that would display exactly what it is. But it's definitely apparent that it's nothing that we've ever seen before that fits conventional aircraft. Once we go through all the interpolation and algorithmic adjustments, here's our bird. Although there is that slight degree of algorithmic error, it's still impressive, none to say the least. When I cropped and printed this for a wall hanger, I found that the printer smoothed it out even more. I think the reason this is that the printer works on DPI, which is dots per inch, being an inkjet, and you're asking it to print square pixels. So it came out with more of an image of a craft, which is what I was looking for, although there, of course, is some ambiguity in this that the printer itself created. Now, when I look at this, to me, it looks like some kind of a ship. I see the white outline going around here, and it looks almost like a saucer-shaped craft. However, that's just my matrixing. That's just my looking at it with stored memories, almost like interpolation. My mind's filling in the gaps that I want to see. Kind of like looking at a rabbit in the clouds, or maybe even finding the face of your favorite messiah in a piece of burnt toast. Other people that I've showed it to have looked at it, and they said that basically it looks almost to them like a champagne bottle with the base being the black part and the neck running up here. I tell you this, if there's anything out there flying around in champagne bottles, I'm in. And still other people that have done more work than I have have looked at it and said that the only ship that's in the picture is actually this darkened part. That this white area is diffusion of light where they're using some kind of a cloaking device and it's diffracting the light away from the ship, rather reflecting it to the viewer's uh, view. Um, and that could be accurate. When we forcefully adjust the exposure values on this, where the darks get darker and the lights get lighter, in fact, that actually looks exactly like what it is. So which is correct? Perhaps none of them. Maybe you have an interpretation of your own. Well, to me, anyone who claims without other information that I'm unaware of that this is some kind of alien spacecraft, I would ask them, what did you do? Fly up there and take a peek inside? I think that saying that it's absolutely alien is as bad as claiming that it's a weather balloon on the other end of the spectrum. What it is is an unidentified flying object, something that can't be compared to any conventional aircraft that we currently have that seem to be hovering at an altitude around the 35,000 foot level where compression and oxygen would be mandatory. Also, if it is up there about the same height as those contrails, then it would be about the same size as a commercial airliner, not a small craft. What it is, is exactly what the MUFON organization organized itself to collect data on for the betterment of humanity. So we've pretty much covered everything. The only thing that I can think of that's left is that somebody might lever the accusation that Steve implanted the information by computer graphics on a microchip and hid it on top of that JPEG. In order to do that, he would have had to have done it in such a way that when the microchip was enlarged or magnified, it then came up looking like something other than a chip with that in it, which is exactly what I've seen every microchip looks like. Uh, who has that technology? No one that I know of. And if they did, it certainly would be outside of our pay scales. This video was not downloaded under the Creative Commons so that people could download it and tear it apart and claim it to be their own information. However, under the Fair Use Doctrine, it's permitted to remove pictures for critique or teaching purposes. And you're certainly welcome to do so. You can download this pic and you can put it into your own device and you can scan it, zoom it up, see what it looks like. See if you can come up with something that I missed. The only thing we ask is that you remember that Steve Walkholtz was the one that took this photo, and even though it was accidentally captured, it's a good pick. He deserves credit for it. Interested in seeing what other folks might capture from time to time or hear stories that they have? Attend a MUFON meeting in your area. Here in Las Vegas, the MUFON dates and times and places are advertised on the Meetup Group website.